All righty. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm really excited to be bringing us this uh, this webinar panel today. And I tell you what, you know, I say this for a lot of our webinars that we have some great guests, but today I really mean it. We have three exceptional guests. We have James Kernan, Tom Parker, and Troy T. Bear. And the topic of today's presentation is the company I work for has been acquired. What now? And this was a, a topic that uh, we came up with and we were inspired by an actual post from the MSP subreddit. And I won't read the entire thing here. Uh, you can pause the video and read it if you'd like, but just to quickly paraphrase, uh, the topic was same as ours, the company I work for has been acquired, what now? And, it, and the poster says, I've worked for a mid-sized MSP for 11 years. We had a bomb dropped on us that we're gonna be sold to another company. Uh, can anyone speak about good or bad experiences they've had during a merger uh, situation like this? I'm really trying my best to, and to keep an open mind and stay positive. But given how long I've worked here, and this was my first real job, I'm very conflicted, not feeling so great right now. Any input uh, about what I could expect in the coming months would be great. So this struck me as uh, quite an interesting post just because of the candor of the poster. And it comes across quite clearly that, uh, you know, there's there's uh, some concerns and really deep-rooted concerns uh, that this, uh, this employee is feeling about this acquisition process. Mm -hmm. uh, so we wanted to put together a presentation to kind of address some of these concerns, not only from the perspective of a, an employee, uh, but also from the perspective of, or of a buyer or seller of, uh, of a company um, who has to you know, um, essentially help deal with the concerns of the employees to make sure that the transition goes smoothly. So before we really get into the presentation today, I want to say a little bit about the host broker. Uh, if you're watching this video, you're probably already familiar with the host broker, but we are a brokerage and M&A firm for IT service providers, including MSPs, web hosting companies, data centers, uh, IT service firms, and also we, uh, we sell IP blocks. Um, and we also offer marketing services through our other brand, which is eBridgeMarketingSolutions.com. Uh, the host broker was actually founded in 2005 as a spinoff from eBridge due to client demand. Uh, we had enough uh, companies asking us for marketing growth opportunities, and we started to offer M&A growth opportunities as well. And if you're interested in more information, you can check out our website, uh, thehostbroker.com, where we have a free, evalu a free evaluation available for you. Let's now for a little bit more information about our panelists. And uh, I'll ask each panelist to introduce themselves briefly here and just to tell us a little bit of, about your experiences with m and um, So James, do you maybe want to start us off and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, you bet. Uh, thanks, Devin. I'm uh, happy to be here. I'm James Kernan with Kernan Consulting. Uh, we're headquartered here in Omaha, Nebraska. So we're based in the States. Um, I've been in the industry now for close to 30 years, but the First half of my career, I owned my own MSP in Southern California, um, you know, bought, sold, owner, ran seven different companies, had a successful exit in around 2006. And then since then, just really stumbled into uh, consulting and coaching. Uh, since then, I have uh, been involved in over two dozen M&A transactions, either helping people, you know, grow by acquisition or grow their business and, and sell and, and exit. Uh, I also run the Millionaire Mastermind peer groups and do one-on-one -on -one coaching and, uh, and then special projects like M&A consulting uh, and so forth, but happy to be here. Great, thanks, James. And Tom, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and your experience? Yeah, great, and thanks, thanks very much for having me today. Glad to be here. Um, so I uh, am uh, working with Host Papa. Uh, I've been in the tech industry for around 20 odd years. Um, the first half of my, my career was predominantly on, on corporate sales and biz dev. Um, in the last 10 years or so, I've been with House Papa and um, we've been very, very active in the M&A space. Um, so House Papa, for those of you that uh, aren't familiar with us, is, uh, is Canadian owned and operated based in Ontario. Uh, we are the largest web host in Canada in terms of Canadian ownership. Um, since about 2019, we've been ext extremely busy, as I mentioned, with, uh, with M&A. We've probably done in excess of, of 15 uh, deals for uh, uh, predominantly web hosting companies, um, but also a variety of technologies and, and other, um, uh, other activities. So 
Um, that's really the connection with the host broker. They, uh, as, as those of you that uh, are familiar with them will, will know, a uh, great service and uh, a great relationship there. Uh, so that's, that's our background. Great, thanks, Tom. And Troy, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first off, uh, thank you, Hartland and Devin, for the invite. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, my name is Troy T. Bear, and I'm the owner of a, an IT firm called IT Partners, who originated in Grand Prairie, Al Alberta, with, uh, well, I guess with a city uh, population of just under 50,000 at that time. We've since grown it to operate uh, with offices in Calgary, Alberta, Vancouver, uh, Victoria, and operations in Whistler, uh, and, you know, in Edmonton as well. So. Uh, we started this in 10, 2010, and in every year of our existence, we've grown in revenue, um, you know, from our model uh, right up until 2022. 20, um, during that 12 years, we've been successful in uh, three types of, uh, you know, growth uh, through acquisition and mergers. Two are asset purchase agreements. Uh, there is a difference. And then, of course, uh, last year, um, you know, with Heartland's group, uh, I finally pulled the trigger on a share purchase agreement, which is, you know, it's a different legal, um, you, know, you know, path forward as well. Um, but it also has very good potential exit strategies that come with it. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to be speaking where I can assist on, uh, you know, from the buyer side and, and what I look for. Um, and, and maybe one of the things that I'm missing other than the three successes is probably the 16 to 18 conversations uh, that I, we walked away from for, for whatever reasons, but they're just as equally as important for potential buyers to, to watch out for pitfalls, um, you know, to take the knowledge that I believe James is going to bring as well into why you're going to set up certain uh, processes and structures within your corporation so that when it comes to your exit, you're going to get the most value for that exit. Uh, and so I look forward to contributing and, and hopefully provide some value to, you know, to some potential buyers out there. Great. Thanks for that, Troy. And last but not least, Hartland. Yeah, thanks uh, uh, everyone for, for participating. And I really want to thank um, James, Troy, and, and Tom uh, for um, joining us today. And, and you know, I'll, uh, I'll have a somewhat unique perspective um, from them uh, as well, both um, looking at this from a hosting perspective, as well as MSPs, as well as buyers, as well as uh, the sell side. So. Um, be, I'm looking forward to today. I think it'll be a, a very interesting uh, discussion. I founded uh, eBridge uh, just over 20 years ago, as uh, Devin said, focused on um, really um, uh, IT firms and growing them organically. And then uh, we just ended up with a lot of those groups that for one reason or another wanted to, to kind of grow more quickly um, than they could organically, or in some cases, just less expensively. And so uh, we ended up uh, building out, um, or, you know, frankly, just with, with clients uh, asking, uh, building out a kind of informal um, marketplace, if you like, and, and that turned into uh, the host broker. And, and so, uh, you know, today we've worked with uh, literally uh, like you know, over a thousand uh, IT firms uh, collectively, uh, whether it be hosting or, or um, data centers or, or MSPs or whatnot. So um, um, look forward to, to today and uh, uh, let's, let's get started. So Devin, over to you. Great, thanks Hartland. You know, and as it was illustrated in the Reddit post we shared earlier, uh, you know, going through a tr uh, an acquisition from an employee's perspective can be very chaotic and there's a lot of different variables. So for the purposes of today's presentation, we wanted to kind of simplify the issue by providing a little bit of a framework. Um, and so we've categorized the types of concerns that employees have into four different categories. We have day-to-day, -day, financial, cultural, and technological. And recognizing that there's going to be some overlap between these, um, hopefully by, uh, by keeping to this sort of a framework, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make this a little bit more digestible today. So let's start off with the day-to-day -day concerns. So when we're talking about these, we're thinking about things like, what change can I expect as a result of this transaction? Who will I be reporting to? Where will work actually be conducted? Will I or any of my coworkers lose our jobs? So when it comes to those sorts of day-to-day -day concerns, maybe James, maybe I can start off with you. Is there anything that comes to mind about how you would coach the MSPs that you work with to, uh, to guide their employees and, and to help them to help, to, to help ease the employee concerns? Yeah. So the, the first three questions, I would kind of peel off on one side and then, you know, will I or any coworkers lose our jobs? 
to me, that's something separate that needs to be addressed immediately. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of training. Normally, the, the, uh, the leadership team will come together and select, you know, I break it down into three categories, you know, people, process, and tools or technology. You know, uh, normally, it's the acquiring company. Uh, you know, you've got your tools and processes already. So there's going to be a lot of training of the new employees. But uh, I just wanted to tell a quick story, if I could, Devin, and to put things in perspective that the post that you read from Reddit reminded me of the human element of things. And I'm a numbers person. I was a young executive with a, a big VAR on the West Coast. And uh, the first acquisition that I was a part of, to hop on an airplane and we uh, it was a company called Technology Integration Group, but we bought the microwave of, of Honolulu. It was, uh, they were based in Honolulu. They'd been around for 20 years. You know, it, it, unfortunately, it kind of looked like a VCR repair shop when you first walked into the shop. But the whole plane ride over there, I was looking at all the numbers, all the contracts, the resumes of the, the staff, compensation. I was kind of going through all the numbers element of it. And that's important. But when I walked in through the front lobby and all of a sudden in the, the tech support area, there were about 25 human beings all looking at me. And I walked in with the president and I was vice president of sales and marketing. And immediately everybody kind of pointed the finger at me to start the conversation. And before I could say anything, it just, I remember vividly uh, like it was yesterday. I remember looking in everybody's eyes and the number one concern I felt them communicating uh, or I could see in their eyes was, you know, am I going to have a job? Am I going to, is me or any of my coworkers going to lose their job? And I didn't have this all prepared. It just kind of came to me. But the very first thing I said was, hey, welcome to the team. Welcome aboard. We're excited to be here and we're excited to, to give you guys an update. The first thing I want to say to everybody is everybody in the room right now is going to stay here. And there were there were a couple of people I knew we peeled out and had already left the company. You know, the original owner uh, was going to leave the company. And then like the accounting person and the purchasing person, because central operations were going to be handled through the corporate office. But everybody else, you know, sales, administration, and technical support, we needed everybody else. But to me, that's, I, I want to, you can get caught up in the numbers really quick and, and see if it's a culture fit and all that, but it's the people side that uh, is really important. So I would carve that out first. Um, so I hope I kind of answered your, your question, but I, I remember saying that to everybody and I could just feel the energy in the room, like, uh, you know, everybody kind of relaxed. And then we could talk about some of the other things. You know, we had a, a training schedule over the next couple of days of, of getting people trained on our systems you know, setting goals and expectations. But one of the other things I said, I don't know if it makes a whole lot of sense today, it's kind of funny, but I just said, hey, the first thing I'm going to do here is nothing. And what I meant by that was I want to listen. I want to have one-on-ones with everybody in the team. And I wanted to understand the culture there, uh, but I wasn't going to rapidly just start changing everything in the world because, uh, they had their own culture and it was unique. And I wanted to embrace that and understand that before we blended another culture on top of that. So that was, um, uh, you know, I probably should have said the first thing I'm going to do is do one-on-ones and, and listen. That's what I meant. I wanted to listen to all their feedback before we implemented any, any changes. Very interesting. Um, Troy, Tom and Hartland, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I can go. I think I'd like to maybe offer, um, you know, I think there's some key advice and and maybe just taking it uh, a step uh, precursor to the questions that are going to come post announcement and and that is really uh, doing the due diligence uh, processes when you're identifying you know key resources, the length and term they've been with uh, the current you know company and and begin to identify and set up a merger committee. Um, you know, the, the roles and responsibilities of those individuals are going to corral all these questions that are, are well scripted and, 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 and you know, as we see in the day-to-day -day concerns and the financials, the technology concerns, 
um, you know, they're all going to be listed there. By having a, a merger, you know, group team set up, when you're lucky enough to go through the process of finding the right fit, uh, the right conversations, and then you get to the close, um, you know, before you go and announce, you know, the, you know, the potential merger acquisition is to give the first line of conversation to that uh, merger uh, committee. Um, two things are going to happen there. One is most importantly, you're going to answer all these questions. You're going to build internal advocates with the new group. Uh, you're going to you're you're going to table all the possible questions that uh, the staff and the groups below you are going to run into. You know what is it? What's going to happen after what happens next? Um, and that'll be key. And then when the announcement does come, then you're structured and prepared. Um, you know to ease those questions. Because um, at the end of the day, um, if you are lucky enough to get across that line, uh, the first thing and most important thing is to protect that investment. Um, and yes, you know, the IT model and structure is very key, but to me, the resources, you, you know, are, are, you know, are also just as key as what it's going to look like in your portfolio, you know, after you successfully, um, you know, smash the two companies together. So that, that's the piece of advice that I would, I would, I would highly recommend for anybody um, you know, about to uh, go through the process. And if you are successful is to take that, you know, cautionary step, um, you know, take that extra breath and, and, and put that team together. Um, and you'll find that these key people, um, they're internal advocates and, and they'll do a lot of, the, you know, answering, you know, questions for you and, and really buy you some time to, you know, to, to, to move forward and, you know, in, 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 the, in the, well, I guess the extremely hard work you're going to have for the next three to six uh, months to, you know, intertwine two companies. Yeah, I, I would add to that, uh, if I may, that circumstances of the, of the sale or the transaction will obviously dictate to some extent the communication strategy. But fundamentally, people want to know they're secure. So you come back to James' original point. So there may be, depending on, again on the transaction timing, there may be uh, different people find it at different uh, different points of the, of the process. Um, but you have a you have a transaction purpose. There's a reason why you're transacting and, and why you're putting a couple of companies together. Um, but it's important to remember that people in individual areas need to understand exactly how it applies to them. So people want to know, are they secure, but also what role will they have going forward? And so I think that touches Devin on some of the other other bullets on the slide here. Who I who will I be reporting to? Uh, where will I be working? What are the what are the practical things that will change for me? And I think, again, that's, that depends very much on the circumstances. Is, there, um, is the transaction happening because there's a, there's a missing piece in a larger organization and you're looking to uh, really keep the, the acquired entity intact? Uh, is it a similar business and you're looking to get uh, synergies together and, and cost savings and, and you're, you're sort of amalgamating? Um, so a lot of those things, they need to be thought through. But again, uh, just to reinforce my, my original point there, we're, we're trying to make sure that people understand how it matters to them. How will it affect them individually? And, and then they can participate in making sure it's a success from there. Yeah, and I, I think um, the, the interesting thing about this topic is that we have uh, three stakeholders, right? We have buyers, we have sellers, and we have the employees themselves. And although this conversation was triggered by um, the request that came through from, from an employee on the, re the receiving end. Um, we, we've got these three stakeholders, all of whom um, have uh, a vested interest in, in a successful outcome. So uh, you've got, you know, from a, a buyer's perspective, if a, as a buyer, you might be focused more and you probably would be by default focused more on, well, is this, is this, um, is this the right fit for us uh, in terms of the customer base, in terms of the services provided? Um, is in terms of the location, um, uh, revenues, uh, is this, is this uh, kind of the right target for us, et cetera. Uh, and then everything else becomes a sort of a um, you know, ancillary and secondary uh, thought um, or afterthought. But um, you know, the, the staff um, are, are really important. And a lot of buyers these days are looking at acquisitions, not only for the customer-based revenue, revenue stream associated with it, but, but really uh, looking at it as an aqua hire, right? So they, they need the people, um, they need the resources, they need the, the expertise. Um, and particularly if it's a, uh, you know, a niche market or a technology or, or, and just even the intimate knowledge of the uh, customer base. And, and so, to have um, uh, as a buyer, to have um, 
employees who uh, are, are, are motivated to stay and feel like they, their world wasn't just turned upside down, there's an incentive because the, the boat won't be rocked, the customers will be happy and customers who are happy stay. Uh, so you don't end up with the, the churn. Um, and, and then from the seller's perspective, uh, oftentimes, certainly um, with MSPs, less so on the hosting front, uh, but with an MSP environment, most of the time, the buyer wants the seller to stick around for some period of time. Now, it may be three months, it may be a year or more, but and, and it'll vary, but um, they're going to want them to stick around. And, and so um, the, the buyer sticking around will help with the employees sticking around because they're going to feel some some continuity there at least for some period of time that the person that they've been working for for a long time is still going to be a part of this process and um and they're going to uh, uh you know the the, the um the seller um also is, is got their own um, um issues and questions right because well who will i be reporting to i mean i've never reported to anybody before now i need to report to somebody who is that person going to be and and where will that be and what are my the expectations before i could come and go and do what i want when i wanted now maybe i can't do that so so there's these, these questions on these different levels and uh and, and i think it's uh it's, it's, well, it's such an interesting topic because uh, there's, there's sort of so many stakeholders but you know i really um i like troy's point uh of having a committee because i think a lot of this stuff doesn't get thought through um well enough uh in advance and um and so taking an inventory uh with the seller of, of kind of well what, what is the culture at your company right do we i've heard stories where there's um Friday afternoon, we we do our our you know our drinks, right? Whatever you call it, happy hour, or or um, we take Friday afternoons off at our company. Well, the the buyer's company doesn't take Friday afternoons off. In fact, they work right till six o'clock every day. So now, what do you do? Um, you, you need to make sure that that, uh, that there, there's there's going to be some way to address um, you know a, a very different um, environment there. Yeah, great points there. Uh, and so just one one thing I wanted to ask and kind of trying to think about this from the employee's perspective a bit too, is I can imagine that every company who makes an acquisition probably tells the employees that no one's going to lose their jobs, right? And then inevitably it happens um, at some frequency. So I, I guess the question is really, how do you come across credible when you're making that sort of a statement uh, so that it's actually felt uh, genuinely by the by employees? I'll, I'll chime in and, and just say, normally, you know that up front, you know, it's part of the due diligence on the front end when you analyze the staff and, and uh, most of the transactions that I was involved in, most of the time, back to Heartland's point, you want to maintain that culture and maintain that um, all the employees, you know, you may need to pull one or two out of the equation because you don't need those, but you want to address that right away. Uh, and back to the story that I had, you know, you want to put their minds at ease so you can communicate, you know, everybody here has a job, here's who you report to. Uh, and pretty much across the board, all the transactions I was involved with, the expectation was, hey, we're going to take this existing core team. We're going to plug you into the headquarter office with all these other resources behind it. And we want to grow. We want to grow the local marketplace, so we'll be adding additional staff of su superstars, just like you are, uh, to to the mix. So, uh, but normally you know that uh, I would want to identify that in the due diligence on the front end. So, coming into any conversation, um, you've already uh, removed people that you aren't going to have, and because uh, that's a that's a really important point, Devin. And that that's a culture bust buster right there. If you say one thing and you do something else, uh, that's that's not how you want to start an engagement. And I, I think that um, you know from the um, I'm not involved in the due diligence, so so I don't have full visibility into uh, some of these um, uh, you know the, the analysis that goes into it. But from a high level perspective, I do know that. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the recommendations will also come from the seller. Look, you know, I have these 20 people. 
Um, uh, you know, the, these are my A players, these are my B players, and and then you know these are some that that uh, the, there's there's some problems that I have concerns with, and you might want to kind of uh, uh, take a look at these ones a little bit more closely. Uh, and then of course there's some people who may be great. It's just the reality is is that they're they're redundant, um, and and they're just not needed. Um, and, and they'll. The, you know, oftentimes they'll know uh, they'll, if they're if they're aware of the process right from the beginning, uh, and sometimes they're they're the ownership level too, right? So someone might be the the CFO. Well, now we don't need a two CFOs, so that that person is going to go. And and if they're part of the ownership team, they're already um, kind of tuned into that fact. Uh, but if they're not, then you know these are conversations that, that have to be had and and probably should be had. Uh, um, you know. Uh, right away concurrently with, with everybody else. So, so there, there's no rumors uh, being spread. Yeah, the other consideration is that with a, with a larger company making an acquisition, sometimes there's new opportunities as well. So it's not simply a case of, will my job stay the same? Uh, will I lose my job? But actually there may be an opportunity to learn new skills, to move into new roles. Uh, so I think there's, there's a positive spin here as well. And, and I think during the due diligence process, you want to identify some people that have a high potential and maybe you're looking to bring them into, into the group level and you're looking to give them new opportunities and, and to enforce the overall value of, of the group management as well at that point. Yeah, that's a great uh, point there, Tom. Uh, just to add to that, maybe on the, uh, the reverse kind of psychology of, you know, we definitely want employees to stay. Uh, reality is, uh, you know, when you do put two companies together, uh, the daily pace of their environment uh, may increase uh, to something that they're not normally, uh, you know, accustomed to. So meaning uh, maybe you have a great IT firm, smaller, um, you know, maybe 10, you know, 10 employees and under, and, and their daily routine has been pretty calm. Um, and all of a sudden they're, they're going to be into new, new processes and procedures uh, and a faster paced environment. And, you know, they're excited from maybe day, you know, 10 or 12 on, but the reality is after three to six months, um, maybe they don't have the skill set for that fast paced environment, you know, where you can take advantage of those extra opportunities, because, uh, you know, that is definitely more, uh, more salary, uh, you know, more income, uh, but then there's more responsibilities, more fast paced, you know, those are, those go uh, side and side, but you will, uh, you will have some type of churn, um, you know, with staff that decide, you know what, I'm going to go realign myself with, uh, you know, my, my, my current workflow <laughs> mentality. So that's just something to keep a, you know, keep in the back of your mindset as well. Great. Well, I think uh, we can probably move on from day-to-day -day concerns. That was uh, some great insights there. And uh, we can also talk about some financial concerns from, uh, from employees. So these are things like, what will I be paid? Will I be better or worse off? How will performance be evaluated? What will my role goals and object objectives be? Will I be signing a new contract? Uh, who will uh, pay my vacation pay? So some of this uh, picks up from what Troy was just talking about. Um, but uh, what, what comes to mind for you guys when you think about the financial concerns for our employees going through this transaction? I, I, I mean, I, I think what I've seen uh, oftentimes is that the buyer will try to, um, assuming that they want to keep the team, and generally that is actually the case, uh, that they will be providing some incentives to, to the employees. So salaries will be um, increased, um, benefits will be improved, um, you know, kind of perks associated with the role uh, would, would improve and, and so forth. So that's oftentimes what I've seen uh, as um, you know, part of the, the kind of incentive uh, process. And, and taking inventory, of course, of, of what the existing um, structure is, how much the existing employees are paid, how many hours they're working, what their um, uh, expectations are. I mean, I know, uh, Troy, for instance, you've got um, some pretty cool things that, you, that you're doing with um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, pension uh, contributions, right? So, um, so, so, so there's, there's uh, you know, providing um, a, a bit of a lift Overall, uh, I'll, I think the um, maybe I'll circle back if someone else doesn't cover the uh, the vacation pay and, and the new contract because I think that's an, those are two important points. But I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, I can I can add a little bit you know to that, and uh, I think with uh, having those little like you say incentives and 
Um, so that helps speak to, uh, you, you know, being, you know, being in a large organization, you know, what's in it for you, right? So usually that does come with some bit of a, a salary or income compensation bump um, because you're already identifying that their workload is going to increase to some, you know, to some level. Um, you know, uh, but it's also important to note that um, there's time for, there's two types of sales. An asset purchase agreement is a smaller in nature. And we're, in reality, you're just buying the book of business and, and the client base that comes over and you just start to implement and, and earn those new contracts under your brand. Uh, the next, you know, with a sale purchase, uh, you know, the purchase share agreement, you know, that's different. You have time, you know, there's going to be a lot of considerable time to wind one down if that is the end goal. Um, so when it comes to, you know, vacation pay, you know, your, the books are going to be managed, you know, you know, by one quarterback, but in the interest of you know, the direction of where, you know, where the integration is taking place. So, um, you know, for our group, you know, obviously signing into a new contract comes in, you know, with, an, you know, with our IT partners logo, you know, that's where our, our better health plan is. That's where our compensation plan is. That is the legal document that puts us on the hook to say, we're going to pay you all these wonderful things. We're going to get you access to our pension plan. We want to improve your lives. And, and kind of, you know, nail a lot of those questions about roles and responsibilities. Uh, vacation pay, um, that becomes administrative in, in my books, whether, you know, whether our bookkeeper pays it from the other account while it's winding down, you know, but the end goal is to move it all under, you know, for us, our QuickBooks um, data file. So. Yeah, I think, I think all of these six questions are, are, are critical. And the first thing I'd say is they all need to be crystal clear in writing back to the employee that you would want to retain. Um, I was always a big fan of either retention bonuses, but more specifically, um, increased uh, performance, you know, commissions or bonuses. You know, you'd either want to equal or increase a little bit their, their salaries, but you would want to be able to demonstrate that here's an opportunity for you to make a lot more money based on your performance and achievement of goals. Um, the, the one on the very bottom, Heartland will probably talk a little bit more about this, but you know, who will pay my vacation pay? There was, um, I think it was that very first transaction that I was involved with. I was, there was a staggering number on, on the bottom of the spreadsheet of the outstanding vacation or accrued vacation pay. And uh, in that transaction, it was recommended that the, the seller uh, pays that out before we would sign them on a new contract. You know, they had to always go on, on our contracts um, and would recommend that. But um, uh, I don't know, in most cases, I would say that the liability of the outstanding vacation pay uh, should fall back on the, on the seller. Um, and in some cases, you know, that can be easily overlooked and that number can be pretty substantial. <laughs> so yeah. uh, it's something you want to look at. Yeah, that's a good point, James. I think, uh, you know, for those that are embarking on this, um, depending on the time of the year and your fiscal year, you know, you'll be, you'll be administering what's called, I guess, basically a, a stump year end. Uh, and that will start to get that, that pivotal point on, you know, what part of the networking capital you, you'll be adjusting that is owed by the, you know, the, the firm that got acquired pre April one date versus post April one date. Um, and, and again, I think if you lead with the employment contract and getting them signed up, uh, the vacation pay comes under their group, uh, and then the payout will come from the uh, networking capital. Yeah, so um, I agree with James, your point about this being a potentially big issue. Uh, you know, these are the types of things in a transaction that uh, nobody really worries too much about until the end. And I find out, geez, there's this huge liability and who's going to pay this? And you got to come to terms with, uh, with it, um, particularly with COVID, because a lot of uh, vacations didn't happen. And so you ended up with this... this um, um, uh, accrued, um, you know, uh, pay that, uh, that needed to be uh, dealt with and, or time. I mean, the other thing is time, right? They'd accrued, uh, uh, six weeks of vacation that they hadn't used. Um, but generally speaking, um, it, it is the buyer, um, uh, sorry, sorry, excuse me, is, is the seller, excuse me, who would pay, uh, the vacation pay as well as any other liabilities up until, uh, the, the point of close. And so this kind of brings me to another issue which can freak uh, employees out certainly is that they uh, do end up um, 
in an asset purchase agreement, they do end up um, being terminated. Um, however, they get simultaneously rehired um, uh, you know, at the same time, the same day. So the liability associated with the um, uh, prior, the, the periods prior to close become um, uh, or remain rather with the with the seller, and then the buyer kind of has a clean slate uh, going forward. So that's typically what we've seen is a simultaneous termination and, and rehiring process. And of course, um, as, as we said, under a new contract with new new and hopefully better terms. Uh, if it's um, a share deal, um, and, and Troy has uh, you know, recently done one of those, um, then a little bit of a different story. And so, yeah, it's an adjustment to, to working capital um, at that point. Um, but of course, a new contract can also be uh, signed. One thing, Heartland, that I would add uh, regards to an asset sale and, and what you described in terms of the, the simultaneous sort of um, termination and, and new account. Um, I would highly recommend that people look into employment law in their jurisdiction and, and where the transaction is taking place. Um, and you may need, and certainly in one instance, we've certainly had to um, put protection into the actual asset purchase agreement with regards to the liabilities. Um, because I know in, in Canada, as an example, they uh, the courts do not necessarily see um, the liability, and, and I'll, I'll take severance as an example. Um, as an acquirer, you'd like to think that when the, uh, the seller is, has terminated, they've taken on that responsibility, they've paid out severance. The Canadian courts may view that differently because they essentially have had a continuous employment with the, with the business they were involved in, even though the ownership has changed. And so um, I think what you've described is certainly our experience for the most part, but I would, I would highly recommend getting some legal advice on that point. Yeah, that's a, good, a really good point. Uh, and we've encountered that issue as well. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. Great. Well, maybe we can move on to the uh, the cultural is, uh, concerns slide here too. So, um, for this category of concerns, we're talking about things like which name slash brand will the company take? Uh, what's the direction of the new company? And what are the goals? Uh, what will the company's cultures be like? And will they synergize? Um, and how will I adapt? How will I adapt to the new company culture? And what steps will be taken to get there? Um, so, does anyone want to start off uh, on this topic? Uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll take a quick lead on this. Uh, culture is, is key. If you want to retain your employees along with the financial and, and you know, and, and making sure you're protecting your investment, uh, what they're used to and, 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 and they do well and what you do well, uh, all goes back to that uh, initial um, merger committee uh, and setting that up to what that's going to look like. And that should be a major, you know, you know uh, task item to, to review. Uh, and implement. Uh, I, I wouldn't stress enough that that is that is that is key uh, when it comes to culture. That's the integration that you look for uh, as as part of one of your tick boxes when you're looking at making a final purchase. Um, but that is a key concept, and uh, these are great these are great questions. And I think if you stay ahead of it, uh, you'll have you'll have more uh, more opportunity to protect your investment when uh, when the news is uh, when is brought to everybody and dropped on everyone. Yeah, good, good point, Troy. The um, one, you know, culture is is key. And one thing I would look at very closely is the the company who's getting acquired. Are you going to retain any of the leadership in that organization, um, or or not? And uh, in many cases, you do. And something that I've seen work really well to embrace those cultures and get everybody on the same sheet of music is. Uh, I'm an EOS implementer as well and work with both leadership teams together and take them through. There's 12 exercises that I would walk through to build out their vision traction organizer, which is a, a two page document. And then at the end of us completing those exercises, we build a presentation deck and present it back to the entire company. So both leadership teams, you know, had their fingerprints on the updated core values and the goals and the direction and the 10 year roadmap of where the business is going. And then you need to communicate that to the entire team uh, to, to really embrace that culture and get everybody on the, the same sheet of music. I think the, um, I was going to take the first point here about the name and the brand um, that the company will take. So you know, this is often a question that the seller will ask 
uh, of a buyer is, well, what, what are you gonna do with this brand? And in some cases, the seller doesn't care. Um, they're just, it's kind of more of a curious question than anything else. Um, in other cases, they, they do because this is their baby. They built this, this for, for, for quite some time. And now the, the buyer is simply just going to kind of fold it in into their uh, their brand. And so um, it, it's a little bit of an affront to the, the seller to now um, uh, kind of have this this thing that they created uh, disappear. Right. Because it'll be it'll be moved into the fold. Um, and, and so the employees, um, to some degree, especially ones that have been around for a while, may also uh, you know have this kind of feeling that it's something that they built and, and what they built is ends up being. Uh, disappearing. So I think it's a it's an issue that um, should, should certainly be talked about. Uh, in some cases, it may just not be practical to keep it. Um, there may be steps to, to take. Um, and, and Tom, you know, you're a perfect example of, of this because you've done many acquisitions with many different brands. Um, but um, you know, I've seen situations where the brand is maintained for some period of time, and then it's mm -hmm. it's a, a brand ABC part of X, Y, or Z company. Uh, and then, and then it's a you know an X Y Z company, um, uh, formerly A B C, right? And then the the A B C eventually just disappears. Um, but uh, it is an important um, consideration. And and you know as far as the other points go, I talked about uh, culture already. So I, I think looking at these kind of cultural artifacts and norms, um, and taking an inventory, taking stock of of what exists in in the company right now. So as they say, do people uh, not work on Fridays? Do they do they have a um, once a month um, kind of uh, thing that's that's done. Once a month we we go and we bowl together, or we 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 have a, a, a company kind of uh, um, you know softball team or whatever it is. Um, did, what what's going to happen to to these things? And and in some cases um, it may be that the buyer likes the idea and and, and kind of rolls it out. In other cases there might be a better. Um, um, something that's better than, than what is even being done, but I, I think it needs to be um, you know addressed and communicated and and and, uh, and mitigated. And of course, you're not going to um, appease everybody, uh, but um, the reality is, is there is going to be change. But um, it, not not to, to overlook the importance of some of these things. Well, I, I think it's it's vital to recognize that these are relationships. So you have to invest time and energy in, in making them work. And sometimes an acquisition happens quickly. And in terms of the goals, it, it may be difficult to determine uh, very, very clearly a long-term plan, but you know there's a short-term need and a fit. And so as a buyer, you need to, you need to really evaluate where the value is gonna come from in a transaction. Um, but then you need to be able to, within, um, Within a comfort level, you have to be prepared to invest the time and energy in, in working with the people that are coming on board, making sure they understand what you're about and what you're trying to achieve. And even if you're not able to set out a 10-year plan at that point in time, helping them to understand the, the approach that you're taking and how you want them to be involved in that, again, will make a big difference uh, to their comfort level as to you know, what's going to happen and when. And it will engender, I think, a sense of um, patience. Um, which in the absence of communication, which I think is, is a big failing in M&A transactions, a lot of times uh, on the communication side, uh, people get nervous. And so if, if you're not clear about the fact that something will happen or something is being worked on, and this is what the role of, of the individuals are, uh, is going to be, people will assume the worst. They get nervous. They wonder whether or not they, the, you know, we've, we were promised that we we're going to keep our jobs, but actually in six months time, I'm going to lose it. And, and it's that, uh, it's that in sense of integrity and, and trust that gets lost. Um, so I think you have to be clear with people. And I think being honest and upfront about something like the name or the brand is, is important as well. Um, and even to the point where, you know, you don't want to do a deal and then have a disgruntled seller um, because in, as part of the negotiation, you said, yeah, we'll keep the brand. Um, but then subsequently you, you immediately retire it. So I think all of this comes down to having honest transactions and, and trying to make sure it's a win-win for both parties. Tom, because you've rolled quite a few brands into, uh, into Host Papa, what, if any, challenges have you seen around groups wanting their brand held on to or the team kind of feeling like they're, they're associated with that brand? Um, I, I know this can be a particularly big issue, and I don't know if it's happened with you where, where um, this happened for a number of other hosting brands years ago where uh, the companies were acquiring, they viewed each other as competitors. And, and so what was happening was is that the, the, 
as the buyer continued to buy up other brands uh, and, and these were competitive brands, there became this still this competitive culture within the company uh, where it's kind of an us and them, even though it was everybody was now an us, they still maintained that us and them mentality because for years they had been rivals, uh, uh, essentially. Um, so I, I just curious, how, how have you? Yeah, I, I think in, in our experience, um, we haven't found employees uh, to be you know, desperately attached to the brand a lot of time. I think they want to be gainfully employed. They want to have purpose in their work. They want to be part of a team and a culture that they, they like and that matches, um, you know, their own beliefs. Uh, I think it tends to be the seller who perhaps, you know, created it, has, has run that brand for 20 years. It's, it's their baby. Uh, it tends to be the sellers, I think, that are a little bit more attached to the brand name. Um, but in terms of competitiveness, you know, I think there's an element of that, but I think the way that we've, we've always tried to overcome it is to, uh, is to really focus on integration. So bringing people on board and rather than leaving individual business units, um, in our scenarios, we tend to integrate them into their functions. So you don't have um, five or six different development groups in under different brands or, or different lines of business. Typically you have it more centralized mm -hmm. and that allows uh, individuals to stretch beyond what they've been doing traditionally and to work across other projects with other, other developers. And certainly when you're acquiring a small group of people who have worked in isolation to a large extent, one of the big benefits of, a, of an M&A transaction tends to be that they get to work with other people that have you know, similar interests, similar skills, and, and other people that they can learn from. And we often find with some of the smaller shops, you, you might only have a couple of people doing a particular job development, as an example. Uh, and some of those people like to, to have peers. And so that's part of the integration and, and getting them to be bought into what we're trying to achieve as an organization. Yeah, good point. Well, thanks, Tom. And so our last set of concerns here are technology concerns. So these are things like, do I need new training? Will the tools and systems I'm familiar with be changing? How well documented are new procedures? Will the skills and expertise I've gained be seen as valuable? Um, so, you know, a lot of these are really at the kind of the core of, uh, of how technical employees see their value and, and self-worth and things like that. So, you know, these are very significant uh, concerns. I'm, I'm curious what you guys think about these ones. I think to some extent, it, it depends on the nature of the transaction again with this one, Devin. So um, certainly, and I think it was mentioned earlier in, in the call, um, if we're making an acquisition for a technology, then the individuals coming on board are, are managing something unique. It's something that we don't necessarily have expertise in. We don't necessarily have people that are able to, to run that. So you may keep them and, and have them focused on that. And, and the training could actually be reverse. So it could actually be leveraging the skills and knowledge coming into our organization uh, and spreading that knowledge uh, to, to help the, the broader group. Um, in terms of tools and systems, again, I, I think it was also mentioned earlier that generally speaking, as an acquirer, you have systems and you have tools that you, you try to wanna have standardized across the group as much as possible from an efficiency standpoint. So yeah, that's, that's an area where someone may need to, to change, but. You know, again, from a hosting perspective, we often find um, the companies we're acquiring are working with the same sorts of technologies that we are anyway. And so there's not necessarily a, a major, major shift shift there. Um, and then in terms of the skills and expertise, for, you know, to close for, for myself on this, I would say that it, it points back to, um, is it a like for like acquisition? Are we acquiring somebody who or a business that's doing the same thing that we are today? Or are we acquiring them because they offer us something entirely new? And somewhere on that spectrum, um, you're going to find that you, you may have very unique skills that you're bringing in and, and you can actually help us to grow as an organization. Or you may find that um, you have peers that have similar types of skills and you can, you can join a, a large group of people with those skills and, and find new ways to apply them. Those are great points, Tom. I'd just like to add just a small, small item in, in, in when you are doing your due diligence um, for, for an IT MSP and, and, and being an acquirer, you do look for a certain tool sets and what that's going to look on the integration side of things, uh, because those are, in, those are hidden costs. Um, so you want to make sure that you identify what type of integration challenges you may or may not have. 
Um, but I would guarantee you're going to see some type of uh, out of scope, uh, you know, pop your head if you're not aware of, uh, um, you know, a strategy when it comes to, you know, connecting processes. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to mention a couple of things here. The one, one key super valuable asset that isn't normally on the balance sheet is the people and, you know, their skills and expertise and especially in today's workforce shortage, you know, acquisitions and, and acquiring talent is very important. So, uh, you know, you, you should be looking for those skills and, and expertise with the, the people that you're acquiring and, and embellish them. Um, and training, absolutely. There should be new systems training just on the new company, the processes, uh, the tools, uh, in some cases, you're acquiring some of their tools if they're better than, than yours. Uh, and, and there'll be some reverse training like was mentioned. And hopefully um, the procedures and the processes are well documented. Uh, and, and most of the time that's the case, but not all the time. So, but I just wanted to address the people part of it because that's uh, to me, one of the, the key reasons why the acquisition would be a win-win is if you're looking for talent. And, and you know, just uh, from my perspective, I don't get too involved in in this uh, really. Um, the, these types of questions, they're they really end up falling on the, the shoulders of primarily the, the, the buyer. But uh, certainly, you know, James, you would back up, and and uh, you know, Tom, you said it is it's just the well, and, and Troy, of course, uh, that there um, there needs to be. Uh, um, a commonality amongst the tools uh, and platforms and systems that are being used. Otherwise, the, the costs uh, just become a prohibitive uh, to, to try to keep up with all of the, the, the new um, you know, updates and, and different customers using different tools. In some cases, they may be somewhat redundant. In other words, they're both security tools doing the same thing, but uh, just different um, uh, competitive solutions. So, so a lot of times that's a screen in the beginning uh, as well as part of the transaction, but it, you know, it's hard to line them up hundred percent. And so at that point, um, decisions need to be made. And so some of the tools that someone's familiar with may not uh, end up uh, remaining uh, as, as you know, kind of going forward. Uh, but you know, as Tom said, I, I've also seen a lot of times where there's discussions and the, uh, a little bit of a kind of humor comes into it when the the buyer says, "Well, we are on this platform," and the seller says, "Ha, huh, we used to be on that platform. We changed out of that platform six months ago." But their team at least knows the platform right. of the buyer, so they're not they're not having to go to something they don't know. Now they've moved out of that system, and it might be six months or a year ago that they last used it, um, but um, there's still some familiarity uh, with it, and and so. Um, uh, you know, that's, uh, um, that, that often kind of mitigates uh, some of these things. But, you know, you are going to have employees who will not be happy with certain tools. They've moved away. They've made a decision to move away, and now they have to move back. And, you know, that, that, that's going to have to be uh, um, navigated as, as well. Great. Thanks, Hartland. So that's, uh, that's all the slides for today's presentation. And uh, I wanna thank everyone for their time. James, Troy and Tom, those were excellent insights. Um, you know, I, I hope that uh, you know, our poster on Reddit, uh, if they get to see this, they'll, they'll have a little bit more of uh, insight into what they can expect for the coming months post-transaction. And I hope if you're um, an owner or in the, uh, a, a leader in an IT service firm and uh, you, either on the buy side or the sell side, uh, you got some good tidbits and, and wisdom about how to make sure that the transaction goes smoothly as well. Um, so thanks so much everyone for joining today. Um, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, please be sure to subscribe. Uh, you can reach out through our website, uh, thehostbroker.com, uh, info at thehostbroker.com if you have any questions and uh, we hope to see you next time. Thanks so much.